Hi guys and welcome. In this video I'm going to be combining two of my interests, that being plastic model kit building, and um, which I haven't uh, done for a little while. I've, uh, I've kind of been not feeling the mojo as it were for that. Um, and time pieces and obviously in this case a clock as you can see. This is the Academy Leonardo da Vinci machine series da Vinci clock and this is a clock um, with an escapement based on a design of Leonardo da Vinci's and Academy do actually do a few da Vinci uh, kits. They do the um, the helicopter I believe with the, the spiral um, sort of Archimedes screw type spiral propeller lifting system and I think they maybe do the the flying one as well with the the one that's kind of like a hang glider I'm not sure off the top of my head but they do they do a few and um, um, in a little way I'm, I'm sort of channeling uh, my friend Chris with his wooden Wednesdays Chris is a thoroughly nice fella who um, has been entertaining everybody uh, of late with his um, with his regular live streams and builds and he's been building wooden kits one that really kind of got me uh, thinking I like that was the puzzle box that he did recently which was a laser cut wooden kit all the bits punched out and they made into a functional puzzle box that you could set the uh, combination on and it was it was just great it was really really interesting so fancying something like that I was looking around there was a wooden kit of a clock which I do quite fancy I might still build yet there was a marble run which really appealed to me that looked fun but looks quite complex that one and looking around I saw this and I thought well it's not wooden it's plastic but it's you know it's a clock it's interesting and it's going to be functional when it's completed so um, we're just going to jump into the kit so you've got the the box art there and typical sort of pictures on the side and a bit of ah there we go haha -ha. Um, Academy Da Vinci Machine Series. Here's me saying I can't remember what they are and there they are on the side of the box. Well that just shows doesn't it? So we have a self-propelling cart, a paddle boat which is basically like a little steamboat, an armoured car which looks kind of like a tent but you can see uh, the principles behind that and obviously the um, gun ports all around the side. The catapult which is a little bit like a trebuchet, a mechanical drum, a spring guard or spin guard, apologies, uh, some kind of launcher, uh, the flying machine, which is the one that's like a bird, and the clock. I'm sure I've seen the, the helicopter as well, but I don't see that on here. So anyway, never mind. So as you can see, there's a nice little variety. Inside the box, you have um, warning in handling of kits, as science teaching aids, and probably things about small bits being choking hazards and all that, check parts less before and sealing and then the instructions and you have uh, something that I always like, you have a parts call out so you can actually check and see that make sure everything's there which is good. Then we have the bags of parts uh, because we all hate rattly, rattly bags being opened on video I'm going to go ahead open these get them all out and we'll have a look at the parts. Here on the bench we have a bundle of parts all strewn haphazardly about as you can see and we've got two clock dials we've got uh, parts of the escape wheels we've got gears we've got sprues we've got um, parts in wooden colors we've got parts in black colors we have a black sprue here which contains um, the stand and parts for you can either wall mount this or stand it on a bench we've got the counterweights we've got the this little bit here which you need to provide coins for 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 weight I've discovered we've got clock hands and we have got various bits that we will discover the purpose of as we get along a bit further we have got other parts of the stand and the counterweight in brown wood effect it's quite a nice wood effect actually that it's uh, for, for extruded plastic and then we have got various parts of the frame in a wooden effect as well what I'm going to do next is Oh hello, and we've got a random part which looks like it might have actually broken off something and I'm hoping that's not the case. Oh dear, we shall find out soon enough I guess. Uh, 
Where's that from? I wonder. I wonder, I wonder. Hmm. I don't like it when things like that happen. Well, hopefully that's not something serious, but we will find out soon enough. So what I'm going to do next is, uh, as you can see, we've got two sort of regular kind of sprues there. We've got a couple of bags with extra gears and with metal um, shafts, pinions um, for the gears to run on. And we have got some string or cord, which is going to be used for the counterweight. Uh, to make the clock run. So what I'm going to do next is clip the parts because they're all large and Id easily identifiable. So I'm going to take my sprue cutters, just regular sprue cutters, and I'm going to clip all the parts off of the sprue accordingly, like so. And I'm going to put all these to one side and then once these have all been removed, I will be going around and denubbing and dressing up the surface, just, just cleaning everything up with a scalpel and with uh, sandpaper and my uh, very fine sprue nippers where relevant. So. As you can see, like so. So I'm going to continue to remove the rest of those. I'll be back in a moment. And just a little note here. Uh, what I'm doing here is uh, commonly referred to as denubbing, for those who don't know. Essentially, when you take a part off a sprue, you should always clip a part off a sprue with clippers like the ones that you've just seen. And this prevents the when you twist a part off a sprue is connected there for example you twist that and pull it off sometimes it can actually pull a part of the piece that you're putting onto the kit away rather than the, the bit on the sprue depending on which is the weakest point of the gate that connects this to the runner so you should always clip them off wherever possible and then you can clean up with either some flush cut nippers um, that get right up to the edge or a scalpel blade like this that you can trim off and then you can use the back edge of this the the blunt edge as it were as a scraper to drag along and remove seams and remnants of nubs and then of course you can do things like take a file and just dress that up or a little sanding stick something like one of these and just dress the edges up now you can argue that it's really not essential to the building of a kit, but it does make a big difference to the cosmetic appearance. So it's definitely worth it. This bit's a little bit time consuming. And I mentioned this because this particular kit is, uh, which I, I neglected to mention in the first instance, is an entirely snap together kit. You don't need any glue, you don't need any paint. You can paint it, of course, it's a plastic kit, you can do what you want with it, but you don't need glue and you don't need paint to build it. So what you tend to find with kits like this, which are intended for, um, they're kind of uh, a gateway drug into the hobby, if you like, of plastic model kits. And a lot of people buy these things as novelty gifts for people, and it gets them interested in model kits. But what tends to happen with your first builds is people snap bits off, they push them together. And because you might have remnants of sprue gates stuck to things, when you push it to another part, rather than sitting flush like that, you might find that it sits like that, it won't seat fully. And of course, it's uh, you know it's, it's a little bit of a shame if things don't fit quite how they're supposed to do so. Um, it's worth taking that little bit of time just uh, just to to denub and clean up. And in reality, if you're starting out and you don't really have much, you can buy a pair of Zuron sprue cutters for three or four pound, I think, from Amazon, uh, like the ones that you just saw, that will cut fairly flush to the sprue. A scalpel, which is an incredibly useful tool to have anyway, and a set of blades are so, so cheap, the Swan Morton ones. And it's an incredibly versatile tool, useful for loads and loads of things. And it's probably the thing you will use most in your, hob uh, your hobby model kit making, um, as well as other things. 
So you can use that, the blade side and the dull side, to, to trim up the parts. So really, for this kit, you could get away with uh, a pair of screw cutters or something that will cut close, nip the parts off, and a scalpel. So it's definitely worth taking the time to, to clean up all, all your nub marks, all, all your, uh, what, what they call where the gates attach to the parts on the runner. So definitely take your time, clean those up, and everything will fit together much more nicely. We're coming on to starting the assembly, and let me tell you, Leonardo is not messing around. He's diving straight into the escapement with step one. So we need a few parts. We need the escape wheel or wheels because there are two wheels. These push together and they can only register in one particular orientation. And as you can see, they align in such a manner that they double up on the number of teeth. You then need a 45 millimeter hex shaft, which I checked with my ruler to make sure it's the longest one in the bag. And that's the one indeed. You start with part B1 here, and then this section just presses on like so. I've already pressed that on before I realized uh, that I wasn't recording, so I don't want to risk taking that off because it's a very tight fit, but it just presses on like so. The escape wheel then slides in like so, and then the, the um, pivot, the hex shaft, presses down into the pivot hole here and this is a blind pivot hole so you can't go too far so you basically push that until it contacts the bottom and there we go next step is to take the this bit here and the what would be the pallet fork essentially i guess <clears throat> This then goes into this section with the thinner end coming out of the front and the counterbalance shaft and its weights fit on the top. These weights just press together and then press onto the shaft and they can be slid back and forth. This bit, the thicker end goes through this slot at the back and presses until it clicks into place like so. This sits on its little pointy pivot down here and the arrow must face forward. This is obviously to ensure correct orientation of the three points down here. This then presses onto the back. This is for the wall mount. I probably will be wall mounting this I think. So this presses onto the back like so. And then this bit presses over and through these holes, and that holds the counterbalance shaft oops, in place. If I don't if I actually keep it in place while I press it on, of course, and stops it doing what I've just done here. So there we go, let's try that again. So press that on there and press that into place nice and firmly. There we go, lovely. And that gives you a bit of an idea of how, how that's going to work. That's great. Um, so that's the escapement part, assemble part A2 while maintaining direction. Yes, we've done that. The next step, we need part B2, which is obviously the bit that goes above here, but I'm just going to put that aside for a second. C17 and C16, which are these parts here. There are two of those. And these press together accordingly. And they make two little pulley wheels. They fit, seem to fit together quite easily those, but they are quite firm. So as I thought they might be loose, but no, they're, they're actually quite firm. So we've got two pulley wheels and then we need these two bits right here and these two bits right here, which look like little key pegs. So we need to put one of these pegs through here like so and into this arm. Make sure that's free spinning. 
I don't think it needs to be incredibly free because I believe this is what the counterweight runs up and down on. Um, but obviously needs to be free enough so that it's not going to, the string's not going to just get hung up on there. Yeah, there we go. And then these slot into here accordingly. Until they are flush, I'm assuming. That would be the logical conclusion. Got to say, everything so far is slotting together really, really nicely and positively. So that's that's very, very good. Um, okay, so that's that. We then come back to this and add. We can just sit this on top now, I believe. Hmm. I've got a sneaking suspicion I'm missing something here. I am indeed, I've got it upside down. How is that possible? Ah, it's possible because, foolishly, I put these in the wrong way around. So don't do what I did and put these in the wrong way around and then get all confused as to why it doesn't fit. Um, and, oh, ooh, oh, oh no, darn. I'm gonna have to add a little bit of glue to that because as I mentioned about it being a really good firm tight fit, I've actually slightly broken one of those fitments. So, oh. Don't you just hate doing things like this? So yes, do uh, double check, check and double check everything before you fit it because while it's all a very good tight fit, which is really, really good with respect to uh, everything fitting and staying in place, it's not great if you want to take it apart. So um, let's put a dab of uh, extra thin on here. What a nuisance. Uh, interesting though, that has got a little void in it, which obviously wouldn't have helped uh, with that, but I think it should hold firmly enough. So I'm just going to press that together and leave that to set up a moment. We'll be back after this commercial break. Right, put the cap on that before I start floating. And we'll press this back in, just double, double check that I have actually got it the right way around this time, and I have. And then we're going to squeeze this back in here, like so yeah, you can see the little hole, the little void there, and that's that's obviously the weak point and and where it went. What a nuisance! But it's fairly firm. I'm I'm quite confident that'll stay in place, and I can always run some glue on the actual thing itself if I need to. So we're back to the main body of the clock, and locate the pivot through there. Make sure everything lines up. Make sure I don't have to put anything in between these before I seal this and press it all closed. I know I think we are good. And press that together. Okay, and we've got the main body of the clock and its escapement so far. That's looking good. Next, we need to start adding some gears. We need a 31 millimeter shaft, not a hex shaft, so it's one of the round ones. A jig for assembly. Where's the jig for assembly? Um, oh, jig, here it is. Here's some gears in the little plastic bag. Jig for assembly looks like a button, and it says on it, jig. 
so you cannot confuse it for a part, which is good. That is used for the assembly of gear D5, which uses the 31 millimeter shaft. So we get our handy steel rule and we measure to check that this is indeed a 31 millimeter shaft, which it is. And we take a D5, 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 D5. which is one of these, D6, D5, there we go. Let's move the plastic bag out of the way. Um, D5, so jig four assembly, 31 millimeter rod, we press this through. It's about the same both ways, it's actually quite, quite strong, which is obviously why you need this uh, jig to help align it by the look of it. I'm using the blade of my scalpel, which you can't see off the screen currently, but just enough to get that pivot through so I can actually align it in the jig. And you then, being careful not to slip and stab yourself, um, use that to obviously set the depth of that pivot, which is a nice little touch, very nice. And there's a couple of little knobs there on the clock that I'm just going to slice away so that they are not in the way. And I've just broken my knife blade. What a nuisance. This is quite hard plastic, uh, but on the other side of that, these knife blades I have at the moment are not genuine Swan Morton ones and they're a bit rubbish. Um, they're actually very good blades. They just really really thin down here and they snap easily and I've had a few do that unfortunately but thankfully they're very cheap but the next ones I get will be proper Swan Morton ones uh, so don't cheap out get Swan Morton blades okay so D5 goes into this pivot here which I think is a blind hole so that could have probably just been pushed into there anyway but I suppose there's a risk of it going through maybe um what else have we got what else have we got Right, we need the tiny gear, this one here, and this one needs a hex shaft because it has a hex shape in it. Does it go in a particular orientation? It doesn't say, it doesn't actually say. But one side is flat and one side is slightly rounded. So I'm not 100% sure actually, the slightly rounded side, even the hole looks a little off center even. Um, hmm. And that fits onto I'm going to go with a slightly rounded side down because that, if it does contact the clock, it's going to give the least amount of friction is my guess. If it contacts the clock body, he says, but I don't know if it's actually going to fit that way. No, I, obviously not. And that's why, because it's not a through hole. I should have tried it both ways first. So it just actually drops, as you saw, straight onto there like so. So, uh, so there we go at the moment. Right, oh, uh, hex shaft. So that hex shaft is not for that because it fits onto the one that's part of the escape wheel. The hex shaft is for part D7, which is this gear. And no, it's not, possibly. Okay, I need to study this moment. I'll be back in a moment. Right, so we're back in and there was some confusion there. I was, um, I don't know if it's me or if the instructions are just a little bit unclear. 
uh, but I was trying to wrap my head around this. But uh, I was looking at this bit here, which is the optional assembly of gear. And you get two options for the um, gear wheel reduction for the timekeeping. And I was looking at this and thinking that this was connected to this, but these are gears that you use regardless. So you've got D5, which is this one down here, which drives the uh, the small hand. You've got the intermediate gear here, which is the 10 tooth gear, which just drops on. You have got the D3, which is this one with the pinion gear in the middle, which uses the 20 millimeter round shaft, which is a short one of the two remaining round ones. That fits into there and that simply drops over it like so with the pinion gear uppermost. You then have D7 and the hexagonal gear shaft and that drops on, whoops, that, that drops on, if I can get this, uh, come out, come out, that drops into there, and that drops onto there with the pinion gear underneath, and onto that fits this, which is your click spring, and it goes in, is this the correct orientation? Yes, uh, it doesn't actually show this until a couple of, uh, a couple of bits further on, but I'm putting it in there now, anyway. So it's got a bit of light over here. Let's see what the light's like. It's not too bad, actually. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's your basic setup. You then have an option of two different wheels for the clock up here. You have D6, which is this tiny little one, which gives you a four to one reduction. That sits there and drives off the outer edge of this gear. And that gives you a much faster rotation of the hand, um, essentially giving you uh, full rotation being about four minutes, um, which just seems a little bit odd. Um, I don't know, unless you want to time an egg, maybe, something like that. And then the other option, which just makes more sense to me, is D1 which is a 60 to 1 ratio, and very obviously being a 60 to 1 ratio, you yeah, 60 minutes in an hour. You use the jig as previously, and then the uh, last 31 millimeter shaft, press that down, and that gives you the perfect alignment, leaving 18 millimeters protruding from the top. That then sits like so, And then that gives you your standard 60 to 1 ratio. And as I say, this to me personally, to me, makes just makes more sense. So I'm going with that one. Um, but I presume, um, as long as you could take it apart carefully enough, you could change it if you wish to do so. But a four minute one just seems a little bit odd. Um, okay, so where are we at now? So that's, that's the assembly there. That's the click spring in place. And the next part of the assembly, we've done that. We've selected the gears that are going to give us the correct timing. So there you go. There's your optional, uh, optional assembly is the small gear or your large gear. Uh, I thought it was a, an alteration of those as well, but it's not. Uh, so that there with your click spring. And then the next step is the winding mechanism and the string. So we find the longer of the two strings on this card. One's longer than the other. I'm guessing this is going to be the long one. Ha, look at that, how did I know? <laughs> so we take the longer of the two strings and we tie a knot in the very end and this is where my lack of fingernails um, becomes a hindrance rather than a help. But thank goodness for tweezers, eh? So we tie a knot in the end. I want to tie this as close to the end as I possibly can because I want to utilize as much of this string as possible. Um, because my thinking is 
Obviously, the longer the string, the longer the power reserve. It's kind of like putting a bigger spring in a watch. So, we then sandwich that in this little slot, which is quite a clever, nifty little design, I think. Like so. And poke that in there so it's a bit neater. Oops. He says as he pulls it out. There we go, like so. And we take the other part, flange side down, and press that. Whoops. Oh, the, oh where's it gone? There we go. And we press that firmly onto there. That secures the string in there. And you'll note this side has ratchet teeth, which conveniently mesh with the click down in here. And the whole thing, if I actually get it lined up properly, fits onto this hexagonal shaft. He says, there we go, like so through the pivot hole and it presses down like so. There we go. And then, as you can see, you've got a ratchet uh, click. So it will slip in one direction, as these things do. but allow you to wind the mechanism in the other. There we go. And then that comes up and over here and then down to the weight. This is good, I'm liking this. This is, this is really novel. It's interesting. Now this is the kind of thing I would have loved as a kid. You know, educational kits like this, superb. So, what's next? So we've got that in place. We need to tie another knot in the end for the little hook which your basket of weights or coins goes onto. But I'm not going to do that just yet. I'm going to take this bit right here with the little clickety windy arrows showing you which direction you wind the clock in. And this sits on here securing all of the pivots making sure that none of them can escape and go wandering off, making the clock inoperable. Super duper. Oh, this is great, love it. Um, right, next, it shows assembly of the base now. I'm just going to kind of click this together, but this is the base. Um, I will actually display it on this uh, just at the end of the video to kind of, so we can get a look at, at what's, what it looks like. But I am going to use the, the wall hanging, I think, because I just kind of think it's, uh, it's the type of thing that looks nicer on a wall, a clock like this. But that's, that's the base with the feet like so. And then this is the other one, the optional wall hanging one. And obviously you choose that according to your preference. Uh, so that's that's how it looks with the wall hanging one. Hangs on the hook there and then that stay sort of maintains its distance from the wall. But what I'm going to do for display purposes is pop this little fellow on. And these are quite easily interchangeable by the look of it. And that will allow this to stand upright, thusly. Fabulous. So, putting those aside for now. The next step is to tie a little hook in, uh, tie a little knot even, in this hook. Find my tweezers. And... Again, I want to tie this close to the end, giving the longest length of spring, spring, string that I am able. And I want to double knot this because obviously it's, uh, it's not trapped in place like the other one is. 
at the other end of the pulley so hopefully I can twiddle this around here like so and grab that end lovely right, so I need to grab that before it disappears and pull that tight fantastic so there, oops, that's not so fantastic, it's coming undone. Let's uh, try that again. There we go. So there we have this little hook assembly, which I may need to retie in a moment, but it'll do for the moment for test purposes, as it were. And I'm going to assemble the weight basket, which is just simply a push fit of the halves onto the face of this little coin tray, which essentially it is. I suppose technically speaking, you could use anything um, that has weight, but obviously it's shaped with the intention of using coins. So the next thing to apply is the clock face and again push fit and again it can only go in one orientation but the top one is obvious because it is a clock face with 12 at surprisingly the 12 o'clock position and so on and then the lower one um only goes in one orientation but it doesn't really matter with that one anyway or it wouldn't matter rather because looking at that there are no specific markers on it so that's that one the hands then just press onto these pivots and looking at this now i can tell that there is not actually going to be a means of setting the time on this so this is not really going to be a practical timekeeper that much I can tell straight away because um, there's no there's no means of actually moving the hand to set the time which of course makes it um, not a great deal of use in respect to being a timekeeper but it could still be useful for uh, for a timer or something I don't know I mean it depends how accurate the thing's going to be I guess uh, just for being the sake of being picky I'm going to set them both to 12 because I, uh, I tend to do things like that out of habit and the final part is the little winding key which is like a little uh, what do they call these a uh, butterfly nut uh, is it a butterfly nut wing nut that's the word I was looking for I knew it had something to do with wings or butterflies uh, yes wing wing nut and this just presses onto the hex shaft without dropping it, preferably. And ooh, with a little bit of support from the rear. Fabulous. And with that around here, I'm just going to stand this up a moment. Oh, there we go, look. And you turn this and it clicks accordingly. We put a little basket on. It's kind of almost like a little toy dump truck. <laughs> and we wind this up until the little basket is up here. And then We've got some misalignment going on. Well, I'm misaligned somewhere, bear with me. Um, let's try that again. There we go. So as you can see there, if I can time this accurately enough, I can actually fit a slightly longer spring to this looking at it 
a lot of string even, I keep saying spring and I mean string. Uh, I can actually fit a longer string to this and obviously being wall mounted you can make it as long as you want within reason but it's, it does have to fit on this pulley without um, catching. And obviously this can be timed in such a manner that it counts 60 seconds and then this in such a manner that it counts 60 minutes. So with that noted I'm going to just for a moment try and realign that hand to the 12 there because I'm kind of picky like that. Right and then obviously we uh, we add weight and then adjust the timing by moving the balls in and out there. And the final thing to do for aesthetic purposes is to tie this little counterweight which is obviously purely decorative um, but it's going to look odd without something on the other side so we're going to go ahead and put this fellow on oh, oh, come here you I think what I shall probably do with these at, um, once I've got this all set up and running properly is put a little dot of super glue on these just to to hold them in place because a bit of bit of super glue on a knot works wonders for keeping things um, where it should be with regards to string especially this this is that kind of slippery stuff have I got some super glue in here typically I don't so I will have to go and get some from the fridge because of course everybody who knows super glue keeps their super glue in the fridge uh, but yes, that gives you the idea. That is going to sit on there, like so. And um, as a counterweight. So uh, I wonder if I can, I'm gonna see if I can actually, rather than having to tie this up here and have it look like it's got a, a, a knot that's dangling. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can just trap that in there, which I think I can. And I think that should theoretically look a little bit neater it would I think it would look nicer if I could somehow uh, put a slightly longer bit of string so it goes it looks like it's going somewhere um, and the problem with that is it's actually a little bit a little bit too um, too long now but yeah I think oh no that's cool that's cool we can do that because I can set that one a little bit tighter so Excellent. So there's the clock completed. Um, I'm really pleased with that. I think that's a nifty, nifty little thing. And I'm going to get some weights, some coins, and I'm going to have a little bit of a play at uh, setting this up to um, and see if I can time it to, to count a minute. So uh, that's where we're at with this. Uh, I've got to go and raid the piggy bank and find some coins to put in the little basket. And then we'll see what we can do. Alrighty, so we're here with the um, clock completed and I've just been playing about with the sort of ticking and timing and what have you a little bit. And what I've noticed is although this is very sort of slick, slippery uh, thread, it is catching occasionally on this little pulley and slowing it down and sometimes stopping. So what I'm going to do here is take some beeswax, which I use for... Um, uh, well, for various things, but I, I initially got this as a nozzle sealer for um, for the airbrush, which is it's uh, it's perfect for sealing when you don't use a an O ring and you don't have a perfectly sealing nozzle. And I'm just going to um, wax this string by simply running the string along it, which deposits a thin coat of beeswax and this is something that um, I uh, interestingly I wouldn't have known about but for a recent thing uh, I was looking at book binding because I've actually printed off some old books some old 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 out of print like 18 uh, late 1800s uh, um, books uh, which I want to bind into a book format 
um, rather than keep as loose leaf because I, I tend to find if a print document's in loose leaf, they get filed away and I never bother using them because they're just too much of a faff, whereas a book I will actually sit and read. Um, so I was looking into methods of book binding and one of the things that you see regularly involving threading like traditional book binding is using a waxed cotton because it, uh, it helps the cotton uh, to thread through the pages when you're binding and it stops them sort of fluff the fibers fluffing out. So my thinking is if that's the case if I wax this thread like so in theory that should help with the fibers sticking to um, snagging on this this wheel here and obviously what I can do as well if I need to do so is uh, is take this wheel off and just give it a clean up and a smooth um, inside there but hopefully this this will do the trick so let's just uh, see how that goes Really useful stuff beeswax, it's great. I, I used some of this as well to make um, a, a beeswax and olive oil polish for the wood that I did in my pen turning video, which gave that a really, really nice finish. Mm, I think we might be on something there. I think that's, uh, that's certainly looking better than it was because obviously there's little fluffy fibers, uh, even though it is quite a smooth string. And if you've got any, any slight bits that it can catch on and snag and hang up, it will do. Um, I've moved the counterweights quite far in at the moment and it's ticking probably twice as fast as it really should do right now. But as I say at the moment, I'm just sort of playing with the, the running of it and seeing how well it runs. Um, it's certainly not gonna win any records for uh, chronometer certification. Uh, but it's, it's great. It's a great fun little thing. I really really like it. I like it a lot and I've just noticed another little nubby bit which I need to trim off because that's going to bug me because I know it's there now. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a great great fun little thing. I really do like it. At some point, if, uh, if I can be bothered, um, I might take off the clock faces and the hands and paint them just to, uh, to make them a little bit more interesting. Uh, maybe just paint a you know a ring around there and, and paint in the uh, the numbers. It would be quite nice, like an old vintage iron sort of clock face, like you would see on a bell tower, perhaps. Yeah, I think that'd be quite nice. We'll see. We'll see about that. But uh, yeah, it's it's great. So it's, a, it's a, a great little toy. Um, essentially, it's it's obviously like I say, it's it's not intended to be a serious clock, but it's really really good. I like it a lot. Well, I'm quite happy that that seems to be running more smoothly. So what I'm going to do now is work on trying to get it timed up sort of reasonably. And, um, and then I'll give you a sort of look, a look at it running and hopefully mounted onto the wall. And um, as you can see there, as soon as the weight uh, hits the bottom there, it won't run for very long on your desk because it only goes so far down. As soon as the weight hits the bottom, of course, it will stop. But obviously if you lift it there's enough string on here incidentally and it will still reach the bottom at that and um, and run out so so it will still actually go all the way down and uh, and and still hit the bottom there so that means it will probably run I think it should be able to run for about half an hour um, on the length of string that it has, which not much use in general uh, real life terms, but it's fun. It's, it's interesting and it's a nice soothing tick sound. Out of curiosity, I actually tried putting the microphone of the time grapher um, that you see just here. On to see if it could pick up the tick of the escapement, but unfortunately, I think it's just too quiet and it won't it won't pick it up. I can't get the microphone close enough, really, 
Um, so that was a shame. That would have been a fun thing to try. So what I'm doing to try the timing is uh, I was um and ah and thinking, how can I do this? And then I suddenly thought, oh, a metronome. Now, I've got a metronome somewhere upstairs from my old days of music that I was never very good at and stopped doing. But there's an online metronome. And as you can hear, that will give you a 60 beats per minute tick. Quite a handy little thing. And you can actually listen and match the ticks. Obviously it's beating too fast just now. Uh, but yeah, useful little thing to try. I've discovered that the weight that's needed to overcome the friction means that it will tick too fast even with these weights. Whoops. Even with these weights all the way out, as you can see there. And things that we've learned during the building of this, um, waxing the string is, is a terrible idea because what happens is when you wind it, it winds onto the coil onto itself. And it sticks to itself, making it not uncoil smoothly. And um, although it helps with the pulley side of it, uh, it, it doesn't uncoil smoothly because it sticks to itself because it's waxed. So what, what kind of idiot would do something like that? If anybody suggests something like that to you, just, just ignore it. Don't do that at all. Don't do it. So I now have to find some, uh, some more string. Um, I can't believe I listened to whoever it was that told me that was a good idea. Anyway, so that's the Da Vinci Clock. I'm really, really pleased with it. I am going to try some new string and I am going to mess around with the weight and see if I can get it to tick a bit more um, respectably. And um, with the length, I did figure out that with the length of it, once you've got the ticks right, it would, uh, on a full unwind of the string, you'd probably get about half an hour of running which I think is not bad. So it's certainly not going to be any use with regards to practically telling you the time, but you could use it as a bit of a timer and it's certainly lots of fun. So there you go, the Da Vinci Clock by Academy. And I hope you enjoyed this and thank you for watching and we will see you in the next video.